Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's New York State Archives presentation entitled Introduction to Historical Records for Local Governments. Today's presenter is Maria McCashin. Maria is the New York State Archives Regional Advisory Officer for the Capital District North Country Region. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box to the right side of your screen and we'll answer them at the end of this presentation. And as always, our webinars are uh, being recorded and they will be made available to everybody who registered uh, and we will put it out on, the, uh, on our YouTube uh, page as well. Okay, uh, at this point in time, I will turn it over to Maria. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our winter webinar series. I guess the snow today is compliments of the New York State Archives. This is our fourth presentation, Introduction to Historical Records for Local Governments. We have a final presentation on March 21st. Lorraine will, Hill will, pre will present Developing or Renewing a Records Management Plan. As we know, archival and historical records are necessary to document local governments and the communities that they serve. An organized effort to care for historical records will include the elements on the slide. And the discussion today will include an overview of these elements, including how to identify historical or archival records, organize them, provide them with appropriate storage, and make them accessible and preserve them for future generations. We'll also discuss some resources to support your historical records program. Along the way, I'll be pointing out some state archives publications and um, in order to provide you with additional information and further insights on working with historical records. And I've included on this slide a link to these three publications. We know historical records matter, but let's just go through the list. They're needed for administration. We use historical records to understand the origins of policy and program decisions and to gain a perspective on their progress. I left out education. Um, in the introduction of historical records into educational curriculum contributes to students' understanding. Of, of history and it also advances their appreciation of the past. For legal reasons, records are often used to protect our legal rights. Maps, photographs, drawings, and land use permits provide evidence on how the land and other natural resources were used and are used. We need them for infrastructure. Our bridges, roads, water, and sewer lines must be maintained. Land grants, maps, deeds, and other records are used to determine property boundaries and ownership. Health researchers use census data, medical records, personal diaries, and other historical records to study genetic diseases. We use historical records for exhibits. We use them for entertainment. Historical records are used to write fiction and nonfiction, develop advertising campaigns, and to authenticate costumes and set designs in movies, televisions, and theater. Check out publication SP03, Archives in You, The Benefits of Historical Records. This talks um, about the value of historical records, also where they can be found, how they can be used, and how to care for them. Appraisal is the process of identifying and evaluating records to determine their ongoing importance. Next, I'm going to talk to you about identifying historical records, how your retention schedule can help, and why the appraisal process is important. An historical or, or archival record is a record that should be kept permanently 
because of its ongoing administrative, legal, fiscal, or research value. Often this is clearly indicated in your retention schedules. You find an item, you read the description, and it's followed by retention, permanent. Records that have administrative value support ongoing day-to-day -day administrative affairs of government. Examples include things like minutes of meetings, policies, procedures, and annual reports. Records with legal value document legal obligations and protect rights, things like city charters, contracts, and deeds. Records with fiscal value establish fiscal responsibility, accountability, and they also track revenue. Examples include budgets, ledgers, and assessment roles. In some cases, the schedules identify record series that have potential historical or other research value. And this is indicated by notes in capital letters in your schedule following a particular item. The note might say, appraise these records for historical significance prior to disposition. Other times, an event, circumstance, time period, person, ethnic group, or a structure unique to a community will determine historical or archival value. Since these values vary from community to community, the RMO, creating office, governing board, CEO, or all of those combined maybe in a records advisory board may reevaluate or appraise certain records and decide that various non-permanent records, as indicated in the retention schedule, should be kept because of the historical value to a particular government. So it may require a group effort to make these determinations. Here's some more examples of historical records and some formats in which you might find them. The format doesn't affect whether the record is historical, but it can make managing these records challenging. I included pre-1910 records. Local governments using the schedules MU1, CO2, ED1, or MI1 require permission from the state archives to dispose of these records. Your schedules discuss this in, in the introduction under pre-1910 records. Often these records have continuing historical or research value because other documentation no longer exists. In some cases, earlier records were destroyed through natural disaster or through destruction by public officials prior to the passage of the first state statute in 1911 that required consent of the Commissioner of Education to dispose of public records. In addition, the volume and type of information contained in records may have changed since the beginning of the 20th century. Older records often have more detailed and historically significant information than those produced today. And sometimes early records have intrinsic value beyond the information they contain. The appraisal process may involve conducting an inventory or a survey. And I included publication number 76, Inventory and Planning, the first steps in records management. It explains the value and the uses of a records inventory, provides a step-by-step -step explanation of how to conduct an inventory, and also shows how to develop a simple plan to guide the development of a records management program. You can use your, your uh, state archives retention schedule, the MU1, ED1, CO2, MI1, or the supplemental schedule um, that's used by state New York City agencies in order to identify records with permanent retention and consider the notes in the schedules. To appraise records for local and broader significance, I've included publication number 50 appraisal of local government records for historical value. This gives a general understanding of how to identify, evaluate, and select records that have ongoing historical value. 
It also includes an appraisal checklist to help evaluate a record's significance by providing lists of questions relating to when the records were created, why the records were created, what information the records contain, and also who created the records. You can consider intrinsic value by evaluating the uniqueness of content and informational value. Intrinsic value refers to qualities such as the value for exhibits, the association of the record with significant events, certain aesthetic value, and any of these that the record might possess beyond the information it contains. I included publication 36, Intrinsic Value of Local Government Archival Records, for more information on that. Transfer of records can mean physically moving records from a government office when they're no longer active or when they can no longer be maintained in that office to inactive or archival storage, which is sometimes one in the same. Accessioning is also a transfer of records. It describes the process of acquiring records, sometimes non-governmental records, as can occur in an historian's office. Either way, records transfers should be documented, either with a form or adding them to your inventory or locator system in order to show clear documentation of the transfer of records to your inactive or archival storage. Particularly with non-governmental records, you need to show that your repository has legal custody of the materials. You need to define any conditions that the donor wants to put on the records, but try to keep the records as open as possible. In either case, transferring or accessioning, to document the transfer and collect information on the records in order to manage them going forward, a form is going to be useful for that process. If your organization transfers government records to storage and acquires non-government records, it's helpful to maintain separate documentation on each. The larger image here is a sample accessioning form and the insert contains data likely to be collected on government records transfer forms. In either case, if you include in transfer procedures a form that the creating office or the depositor can complete, it will enable you to provide a fuller description of the records for your inventory, for labels, and for any other tools that you create. The more description that you can gather when the records are transferred, the more useful and easier to manage they'll be in the long run. Key archival principles when organizing records include provenance, original order, and record series. Provenance dictates that records of different origins be kept separate to preserve their context. So don't mix records created by different departments, even if they're similar in format or subject content. Maps created by the planning department, building and zoning, and highway engineer should not be arranged together as one group. Most records will have an established order by the creating office, and that order should be retained. Don't rearrange records by subject form or date, just because you think that would be a better arrangement. For example, if you found a journal entries arranged by subject, you don't want to put the pages in date order because this seems like the normal way to arrange a journal. Keep them in the subject order. However, when you are um, organizing records, you can correct obvious filing errors. Sometimes it's obvious a chunk has been pulled out and put back in the wrong location. Record series is the standard unit for arrangement and description in local governments. 
Records management identifies and manages records according to record series. This is defined as a group of related records that are normally used and filed together, related to a similar function, and managed as a unit for disposition. Record series can be one item or many boxes, one volume or many volumes. Records organized by series include things like minutes, tax rolls, annual reports, student transcripts. You can check out Publication 40, Fundamentals of Managing Local Government Archival Records for additional details on histor organizing historical records. The strategy for arrangement is to assess the current arrangement. What um, are the records organized by provenance or series, arranged within series? What's the file arrangement? Are any files out of order? Also identify information about the records. Are they self-indexed as a numerical order? Or is there an existing index? If the order's not apparent, one thing you could do is check with the creating office. Consider the need to weed records, including consider the time involved and the impact the result would have on space and also ease of use. Do basic preservation during the arrangement process. Remove things like fasteners, paper clips and staples, unfold the records, flatten them, and clean the documents if necessary. Rehouse them in alkaline boxes and lignin-free folders. Label boxes and folders in the fewest possible words that convey series or folder title, records creator or department, date, box or folder number. Each box and or folder should contain a unique number to differentiate it from the other folders in the box and other boxes. Set a uniform place on the label for the different types of information and keep that consistent. Bound volumes, depending upon their size, might need to be wrapped in archival quality paper. If storage conditions are good, they may also be stored flat on a metal shelf. The objective of description is to give potential users a clear sense of the contents and character of the records and the contents and the context in which they were created so that they can determine their relevance. Include physical characteristics of the records. The level of description also depends on the nature of the records and users' needs. More complicated records or those with higher research interest may be described in greater detail, but you can always add description later if you need to. Information to collect includes the name of the creator, the series title and inclusive dates, physical characteristics of the record series, what format they're in, how they're arranged, historical, or background information about why the record was created, and a summary of the information contained in the records. Describing records will help you build that important subject matter list that's required by the Freedom of Information Law. And it can save you time and money by providing you with enough information to easily find the records when you need them. Now that you have series descriptions, you can use them as building blocks for finding aids and other access tools that provide more detail to the researcher about the records. And these finding aids may be published or unpublished, manual, electronic, or you can put them on the web.
Here's a sample series description from a finding aid. As you can see at the top, it starts with the record's creator information, followed by the series title and inclusive dates, physical characteristics, such as the number and the format and how it's arranged, an historical note about the function of the records, why they were created, and an informational note talking about the contents of the records. So descriptions can be used to develop collection guides, such as this one for the city of Syracuse. And in those guides, you can include complete series descriptions about the records. Or you can use the information to develop collection overviews. This is one page from the Albany County Hall of Records guide to its archival records. You can create an online listing of record series contained by a government, in this case, Warren County. And as you can see, there's some links that lead to fuller descriptions that are also available online. As you describe the records, you can make them available by publicizing the collections and developing tools to assist staff and researchers, including reformatting records to provide online access. Researchers may still want, want or need to use the original records, and these situations need to be controlled with security and preservation methods. Reference service is an excellent way to build support. Let's face it, none of us have budgets to digitize all of our historical records. So you may need to provide a supervised space for the public to use the originals. To do this, you need to determine the type and level of service that you can provide. And you should publicize when you're open and have staff available to assist and to supervise. Have clearly written access policies and list any restrictions. Researchers will want copies, so publicize duplication services or any fees involved and the use of their own equipment, for example, digital scanners, cameras, or phones. Reformatting your records not only helps make your records more accessible, it protects the originals from wear and tear. Before reformatting, you might consider the cost of putting an entire series online versus the finding aid on the website. Or you might consider reformatting only select records, for example, high use records to increase their distribution and reduce their wear and tear. Local governments should follow state archive standards for creating digital images, and you'll find these in the digital imaging guidelines. They include standards for formats and resolution, and also make recommendations for the standards for types of records. For example, imaging photographs, imaging volumes, imaging microfilm, imaging maps, imaging text documents. Other things you might want to consider before reformatting records is how you'll keep on top of technology as it changes. And can you, you know, budget-wise, keep on top of technology as it changes? You also want to consider issues of confidentiality for certain record series. And consider how you'll maintain authenticity 
and integrity of government documents that you post online. And also consider whether or not your website can handle the traffic. Here's another issue that you might face with historical records. You might find them in an unexpected place. Government records are considered alienated when they've left government custody by other than legal means. And there are steps to take when you discover that records of your local government may be in the custody of a private individual, a commercial seller, they may be listed online as being for sale or up for auction, or in the possession of an historical records repository. Usually the first steps include negotiation processes rather than litigation. Legal action is the option of last resort. If you discover records that you suspect are alienated, um, contact, or talk to your RMO. You may want to include your chief executive officer in the conversation, your legal counsel, an historian or archivist, or um, contact your state regional advisory officer. First, you want to confirm whether or not the records in question are alienated government records. If the records do legally belong to your government, your legal counsel should represent your interests in negotiations with the holder of the records. And action will depend on the circumstances of the situation. But there are several types of court actions that could possibly be taken against holders of alienated records. There could be criminal charges, including grand larceny and criminal possession of stolen property, if you can prove that the records were stolen. There could also possibly be tampering with public records, and that could involve a misdemeanor or a felony, where the records may not have been stolen but were knowingly removed from public inspection or concealed or mutilated, destroyed, or falsified. And then replevin, which is common, a commonly used term for a legal action to reclaim the property in the custody of others. And I've included an advisory created by the State Archives reclaiming alienated records to further discuss the steps involved with reclaiming alienated records. Historical records should be stored in a secure, environmentally stable area. They should be protected from hazards, things like vermin, things like overhead pipes, things like poor environmental conditions. They should be housed in proper archival materials and handled appropriately. Reformatting for preservation involves following the digital imaging guidelines, which we just mentioned. You also want to consider electronic records. If you have permanent electronic files, they need to be migrated when necessary. And these could be scanned images or they could be born digital files. You want to have a discussion with your IT staff or your contracted IT and talk to them about the requirements for retention and preservation of electronic records that are required under the regulations of the Commissioner of Education. These include ensuring that records retention is incorporated into an electronic system, ensuring that electronic records are fully accessible and usable for the full retention period, that proper documentation for permanent records is developed, maintained, and updated, and this documentation includes things like the technical characteristics of the records, the contents of the files and the records, any restrictions on access and use, and other metadata elements. Preservation copies of permanent electronic records need to be made and regularly stored in a secure, environmentally stable off-site location. So you want to have backup copies. Also, you want to have maintenance procedures for the media that's used to store the electronic records. 
and procedures for migrating the files and records on the media before they become inaccessible or unreadable. And there are six steps for media integrity. And these are listed in the regulations of the Commissioner of Education. I talk about that again in the uh, program and um, include a link to those. These are the ideal conditions for record storage. Temperatures between 65 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Humidity between 35 and 45 relative humidity with fluctuations of more or less 2% or 5% relative humidity. Having good HVAC systems that provide dehumidification and good airflow and environmental monitoring systems. All of this can be very difficult to achieve. If you can't achieve the ideal, you can still monitor your storage areas regularly and do what you can, especially to limit fluctuations in temperature and humidity as much as possible. And this can be done with portable heaters, air conditioners, and or dehumidifiers. Storage areas also should have no air pollutants, as you might find if you store them unprotected in a DPW garage. They should have no elements of off-gassing that can happen when your record storage room doubles at a, as a um, janitor's closet or if you just store all of your records in plastic bins. Again, good air exchange is important and you want to protect a storage room from light. Um, particularly UV light, which can add a lot to temperature fluctuations. Okay, this slide's a bit of a recap. We covered most of these. Um, steel shelving is recommended 18 gauge or lower. And I included publication 48, Developing an Inactive Record Storage Facility. And this publication provides advice on how to set up an inactive record storage facility. It talks about costs, security, space requirements, environmental conditions, physical layout, safety, and other subjects, such as the ones on this slide. Local governments can set up contractual arrangements with another local government in order to improve the management and preservation of records. So shared service, shared storage is an option. Deeds of gift or deposit arrangements might be another suitable option. A deed of gift can be used when a local government is receiving non-government records or when donating local government records that have met their minimum retention requirements and can be disposed of. In this case, legal custody of records can be turned over to an entity besides the local government. And common records um, sometimes are chattel mortgages, which are not permanent records, only the indexes are. Deposit agreements can involve merely transferring the physical custody of the records. And these agreements may be temporary and legal custody remains with the local government. These agreements may be used in cases where another repository can provide better access or better environmental care to those records. For example, a town might store older historical records in a county facility. With preservation, try to address a collection as a ser a collection or a series as a whole. Most preservation issues can be solved by reformatting and retiring the original by replacing, for example, by photocopying newspaper clippings, 
or other simple basic care, such as better housing, better environmental controls, better handling practices. And these are more cost-effective ways to save historical information than conservation treatments. Conservation treatments involve the application of skilled or manual chemical treatments to repair or strengthen or stabilize records. They may stabilize damaged items or allow for the state safe duplication of a record. Again, these are usually more costly steps. So your primary goal is to save information and use conservation treatments in rare instances. I've included publication number 60, Criteria for Selecting Records for Conservation Treatment. This um, publication has a list of questions to ask in order to determine whether or not conservation is an appropriate preservation option. So when does a record become archival? When they're created. And you want to address their needs when they're created. So for this reason, historical records or archival records, <coughs> permanent records should be created on stable media, if they're electronic, um, or paper for that matter. Um, archival paper for minutes, for example, or server class hard drives and open formats such as PDFAs and TIFFs for electronic records. Records creators, <coughs> records creators and IT should be aware of these standards, again, which can be found in the digital imaging guidelines and also the regulations of the Commissioner of Education, which I included on the screen. Um, I didn't include the link, but that can be found um, on our laws and legislation page. So IT staff should know, be aware of the digital imaging guidelines and also the regulations of the Commissioner of Education. And they also need to know which records are permanent so that the appropriate protections can be applied to them. So for this reason, it's critical that the RMO have a seat at the technology table and be part of the discussion. To ensure support for historical records, you want to share the benefit of the records with your government and community. Use them in public programs, exhibits, and articles to gain support. Work with historians and other users of records. Utilize Archives Week to promote records programs. Use the web to promote historical records activities and historical records. And if possible, budget for an historical records program. I included three publications related to this. Publication 81, it's been around a while, Historical Records and the Local Government Historian, which suggests ways that local government historians can use their specialized knowledge and interests to encourage and support records management and historical records programs that are adequate to the needs of local governments and their constituents. 54, Archives Month Action Guide, suggests ideas for Archives Month activities. Archives Month is October. Got plenty of time to plan. Publication ED01, uh, ED not to be confused with the ED1 schedule. Consider the source, historical records in the classroom, discusses the use of historical records as source material for classroom instruction. Historical records literally can be used to build bridges or determine the, instructional, the structural integrity of an existing one. So take care to index your as built They can also be used for the other kind of bridge building, building constituency support 
by making records available as a public service, for example, such as posting your minutes online. They can bring local governments closer to citizens by providing interesting historical records online to educate the public about their community. They can connect local governments to the rest of the world through websites and social media. So if you're just getting started, start small and build. The next slide is gonna include some resources to help get you started. But it's good to use your inventory to identify priorities, set goals, and implement changes to your historical records program. Starting small can include with a basic can include a basic assessment through a visit from your regional advisory officer or your RAO. It can just involve discussing historical records programs of other local governments. I'm going to show you how to get some additional training on the next slide. And you also might seek grants. The State Archives has local government records management improvement funds that are available to assist historical records programs. Some of the projects that you might consider grant funding for include developing an archival needs assessment. And this could include hiring a consultant. Improving access by arranging, rehousing, describing historical records, or by reproducing and distributing guides and other finding aids in paper or electronic format. Arrangement, description, rehousing, and describing could involve the hiring of a consultant or an archivist. Purchasing storage supplies, acid-free, lignin-free folders, boxes, records, cartons, and paper. Developing websites, brochures, exhibits, and other products that use local government records to edu educate the public and students about community history and the value of records and other subjects. Preparing document-based instructional materials or DBQs for classroom use. Developing programs to train teachers to use local government records as teaching tools in the classroom. Or for your electronic historical records, developing or implementing systems to ingest electronic records and manage them. And any of these projects can be done individually or as a shared service. So if any of them interests you, meet with your regional advisory officer to discuss a project. So these are some free resources. The State Archives offers workshops, webinars like this one. We record all of our webinars, so we've got webinars listed on at least 36 topics, but many relate to historical records, including appraisal of historical records, conducting an inventory, digitizing historical photographs, disaster planning and response, managing historical records, using local government records for local and family history. And as you've seen, we have publications and advisories. The New York State Historical Records Advisory Board, also known as SHRAB, provides advice and guidance to the state archives. And this board was behind the creation of strengthening archives an online assessment tool created for small to mid-sized historical repositories to evaluate and improve their ability to collect, preserve, and make historical records available to the public. This is a great tool. I, I encourage you to take a look at it. The tutorial itself is all online. It includes online text, publications, videos, and templates that cover a multiple 
of topics, multitude of topics, administration, acquisition, processing, preservation, access, support, and online programs for historical records. Um, it's a great overview, and then there is, are, are links to further information. And the, some of the videos are um, representational of a variety of records repositories, so you can get some insight to practical use of historical records. DIPSNY, or the Documentary, Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services of New York. This is a contracted service by the State Archives. It provides education in the form of live workshops, webinars, advice, and other resources. And these are all free. Um, there are some upcoming webinars through DIPSNY on March 14th, Digital Preservation for Small Repositories. On March 22nd, Legal Issues, Copyright 101 for Archivists and Librarians. And, I'm not sure if this is March, but coming soon is a workshop entitled Red Flag Identifying Preservation Needs While Processing Collections. This is a full day workshop and it's being offered in five locations throughout New York State. Something else that DIPSNY provides are free planning and assessment services. And local governments can apply for free preservation surveys and condition surveys. And the next application deadline for this free service is March 16th. And I think they've provided applications at least, this may be the third round of applications. So you may get another chance if you don't meet the March 16th deadline. DIPSNY's website also includes a resources page with further information on topics such as historical records administration, archives, born digital and digitized records, disaster preparedness, education and outreach, exhibition, grants, podcasts, preservation, regional resources, and they also have a free email newsletter, which you can um, register to receive. So, what's the next step for your historical records program? Thanks everyone for coming. And if you have any questions, I could take those now. Oh, uh, hello, Maria. Very good. Very nice. Thank you. Um, just um, looking to see if anybody else is uh, typing some questions. I did want to, again, uh, as Maria mentioned, remind folks that this is being recorded. Uh, also, um, uh, just to keep in mind before you sign off, if um, you're watching in a group of people, uh, with a group of people, say, there's more than one of you, if you could just let us know in that chat box, that would be very helpful uh, too uh, for our account. So if there was two, three, four, five of you, or maybe an entire um, uh, auditorium, give us a number, that would be great for our account. Uh, don't see any other questions coming up. I'm not sure, just check to see if anybody's typing. And, uh, Uh, I don't see any other questions at all. Could be heading home because of snow. Yes. Maybe for the last presentation, we'll just do a light dusting instead of a foot or more. <laughs> ah, Melissa said here, um, you have comments. You mentioned about the storage of books. So perhaps you can expound on that a little bit. Uh, she was saying, uh, question a flat I guess you were saying about storing them flat okay well it is it is better to store them flat because um, it can be hard on the bindings if you're storing them upright okay. 
Okay. Um, just seeing if. Uh, Archival, uh, Archival supply stores also have boxes for them too, acid freeze boxes for flat storage. Okay, I don't see any other questions from anyone. Oh, Melissa just said thank you for that. Uh, um, your comments on the uh, lying some of the books flat. It's fine. Um, I don't see any other questions. I would just like to also point out to folks um, that uh, you can certainly contact your uh, local region, regional advisory officer or e email me here at arctrain.nyset.gov, uh, rather, and I can certainly get your question to uh, anybody uh, on our staff. Oh, Melissa just put a uh, little the resource out there. She our publications page on our New York State Archives website. She said she's printed several of the resources from the website. So nice to hear that. Um, I should have added too. Um, we we do um, we have a listing of consultants and vendors on the State Archives website. These are just people who provide services for historical records programs. For example. Um, archival supply companies, um, consultants and vendors who specialize in historical records, um, and also uh, companies who specialize in digital or electronic records. So you can search for them by type of service. They're all there because they provide the type of service. We don't promote any one particular consultant or vendor, um, but they are listed on our website for your convenience. Um, there's a question here from Maxine. Um, I have audio tapes that have passed its retention. Do you have a template for the destruction or disposition of old records? We do, and, and I could send that to you, or you could use publication 41, um, retention and disposition of records. I think it's what to keep and what to, I don't know if it's throw out, but what to keep and what to dispose of. Um, but that includes a template, a uh, records disposition form. Or I could send you one separately if you give me your email address. But hey, we were talking about permanent records here. What are you disposing of? Just kidding. That's true. Um, Must be just a, just a general uh, question. Um, also, uh, there's a couple more questions coming in. Um, ah, I, uh, Melissa says, I am visiting a group of school kids today, ages 9 through 12, and will be using old local historical postcards to show them what our town looked like, looked like in the 1900s. That's a very nice comment. Uh, that also, is. Yeah. Uh, uh, looks like uh, Brenda has a question here. You mentioned that ledgers would be considered archival. Uh, the ED1 states six years after last entry, but recommends appraisal. Do you recommend schools keep these records long term? That ledgers are a perfect example of some of the older ones contained a lot more information than the more current ledgers, which a lot of the more current ledgers are just tabulations of numbers. It depends on the content, again, and it could be a group effort, but um, I think you'll see if you have very early ledgers, some of them have a lot more detail in terms of what was spent um, or specifically who was paid and what was purchased, um, a lot more detail than tabulations of numbers that you see in the more current ledgers. So it is up to your organization. They are a six-year record, but again, we do recommend that you consider the content. Um, and again, ledgers might be something that if you don't want to keep them for longer than six years, this is um, a 
perfect example of a record that you could um, create a deposit agreement for. And for example, the six year or the, the records that contain more information, um, which could possibly be used for historical research, you could um, gift them with a deed of gift to an historical society, for example, if they'd be interested, or a library. Um, but we encourage you to include a deed of gift so that you can document that transfer. Okay. Um, well, there's a comment here from Melissa. She said, uh, old ledgers sometimes have hidden treasures. They may skip many pages and write in the back, and people don't always look carefully. She says here, the information that a judge wrote in his docket book in 1878 is pretty darn descriptive. <laughs> oh, and uh, Maxine, she was commenting uh, on those records. She said, plan to retain autopsy homicide audio tapes indefinitely. However, I am in the process of sorting homicide autopsy tapes from non-homicides. Oh, interesting. And a whole other issue is how to reformat something like that and what the potential costs are. We've done samples of uh, reformatting older tapes to digital, and it's, it's a, an expensive process. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Anybody typing? So I think uh, that but I guess be it one, for today. one uh, actually one comment about audio tapes is is that would be a reason because it's an expensive process that would be a reason to provide them with the absolute best environment that you can um, in order to preserve them should at some point you have funding available to reformat them. Yes, just a comment here from Maxine. She said, "Tapes. the tapes were not maintained in climate control warehouses, so tapes may pop trying to preserve. Well, I don't... Uh, now, this, would, this could be something that, that uh, you could use, um, you could uh, apply for Dipsney services for a preservation or a condition survey of those audio tapes. And it's a free service. Um, so the applications are online on the Dipsney website. And I've heard the application process isn't too lengthy. Yes, as a matter of fact, I think I'm going to, uh, I'll just put that uh, uh, link into, into our uh, webinar here today. And of course, the folks can go to uh, the New York State Archives website and then click on uh, grants and uh, under grants and awards. And under grants and awards, you'll see um, the Documentary Heritage Program, and uh, it takes you to the page that has the DHP program grants and uh, plenty of information there. Well, I don't see any other any other questions, and we are getting to the uh, end of our time here. The preservation and conservation surveys that I was talking about are through um, the Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services of New York. Um, they're not they're not DHB grants. Those are the contracted Correct. service um, for, and those are free. Those, the application is free. There's there's no exchange of money involved. They would just come and provide you with the preservation or condition survey of whatever records you wanted them to review. That's a good point. I actually um, there's a link there too uh, to Dipsney, and I just put that in our uh, webinar too. Just to, HTTP uh, colon backslash backslash and it's dhpsny dot org. Thanks. And Rich. there's sure and there's a, pl a link to planning the uh, planning assessment uh, planning and assessment uh, uh, offering services. Okay, Maria. I think it's. Uh, 
the end. No other questions from anybody? Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, everybody.